Welcome everyone to uh, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute's uh, sponsored web Zoominar, um, Prospects for Japan's National Security Policy in 2022 and the US-Japan Alliance. Uh, my name is Dan Smith. I'm the Jogel Curtis Visiting Associate Professor of Modern Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy uh, at Columbia University. Uh, and we are delighted to have as our speaker this evening, Yuki Tatsumi, who is the co-director of the East Asia program and director of the Japan program at Stimson Center. Uh, and um, uh, as uh, Yuki will explain for us, uh, she is joining us from a rather um, uh, uh, exotic location in her car uh, and is so committed to sharing her um, her expertise with us this evening that she is uh, zooming in uh, by her phone. Uh, and so we are really fortunate to have her flexibility and uh, we look forward to hearing what she has to say this evening. Uh, so without further ado, I, uh, I would like to um, uh, turn over uh, the uh, mic, uh, so to speak, to Yuki Tatsumi. Yuki, welcome. Thank you, Dan. And good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. So I'm in this, uh, as you can probably see, I'm doing this out of my car. And the reason is just about a uh, two hours ago, my dog had a serious emergency. She had a seizure, so I had to carry her to the emergency room, and I was prohibited from leaving the parking lot until they have something, um, they know a little bit more about her condition. But at the same time, um, um, this was just too, ha you know, this, this happened too short of a notice, so to speak. So I would, I was talking to Dan about it. She, he was gracious enough to um, offer to reschedule, but I decided to just move forward with it. So if I look a little, little um, startled and a little frazzled, uh, you will know why. But hopefully, uh, I will be able to complete the uh, seminar. And I look forward to getting your questions. So because of that, I think I will probably go through my prepared presentation a little bit, a little bit more of a fast, faster pace. Um, in the event that Bed decides to pick up the phone and call me. Um, since I'm doing this on my phone, um, when that happens, I do have to excuse myself to answer that for about five minutes. So um, I very much appreciate your flexibility and the um, a great, um, being a gracious host. So if you can start sharing the, sharing the slides, please, um, so that I can see. Great. So as uh, Dan explained a little bit, um, I would tonight uh, talk to you about the uh, prospects for Japan's national security policy and the U.S.-Japan alliance in 2022. Um, this year is a big year for Japan's national security policy, and I will get into that a little bit um, next week. If you can move on to the next slide, that would be great. I cannot see the screen, so can you hear me? Yuki, thanks for your patience. Okay, it looks like it's back up again. Okay, good, okay. Now, I, I just thought that the, my signal got dropped because I am doing this right side of my hospital. So. <laughs> okay, yep, I see it. So if you can go to page two. So let me introduce myself briefly. Um, like uh, Dan, Dan mentioned, um, I work at Simpson Center. I've been here with uh, Simpson since 2004. But before then, I was bo born and grew up in Tokyo through college and came to the United States to get my master's degree, and uh, which I did with the uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And I hope you guys don't hold that against me. I'm being very aware that I'm with the Columbia University audience. And uh, upon graduation, I worked at the uh, Japanese Embassy as a special assistant for political affairs for a couple of years, and then have been in the uh, think tank um, ever since. I moved back and forth between Simpson and Center for Strategic and International Studies. But like I said, um, I have been with Simpson since uh, 2004. And as the picture that you're seeing can probably tell, I am very likely to be a future Marine mom. Next, please. So this is the agenda that I would like to, um, like to share with you for my uh, opening, uh, opening remarks for today. Uh, first, I will start with the uh, rather basic uh, 
um, basic uh, main key chronology of the history of the U.S.-Japan alliance. And then I would also talk of then um, I will I will talk about a little bit more about post Cold War development in the uh, U.S. Japan alliance and how uh, Japan has been uh, responding to the uh, challenges that it has been facing since the end of the Cold War. And I will finish out with the uh, challenges that Japan see. As I said, um, this year is a big year for Japan's uh, national security policy, but uh, what what awaits Japan? And then I will probably um, say a few words about how I think uh, the current uh, um, unfortunate uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine might affect some of those debates that will unfold over the next, uh, next several months. Next, please. So um, this is a quick snapshot of um, U.S.-Japan Alliance uh, 101, so to speak. Uh, this, is a, this is just a very basic, bare-bone history of the U.S.-Japan Alliance. And uh, with this audience, I think many of you know uh, what those are. So this alliance uh, originally signed in 1951, right after Japan signed the San Francisco Peace Treaty. It, it was revised once 10 years later in 1961, and that is the treaty that, uh, that stands today. And based on that treaty, uh, basically Japan has a basic bargain with the United States uh, that Japan allowing U.S. forces to station in Japan to, uh, to, uh, to help Japan uh, defend, its, defend its nation. But then Japan will provide those uh, um, bases and facilities uh, for U.S. as a host nation. But up until 1978, there really was no clear division of roles between the uh, U.S. military and the Japan Self-Defense Force in terms of what to do when the contingency happens that involves the invasion of Japan, which was the Cold War era premise that Japan's, Japan's defense, defense policy was uh, formulated upon. So in 1978, like you, you see here, the uh, first uh, U.S.-Japan guideline for defense cooperation uh, was, uh, was set. And uh, from this point on, uh, this uh, U.S.-Japan Guidelines for Defense Corporation, I will refer to this as simply as guidelines, because that's how it's uh, referred more commonly. Big event happened, um, big unfortunate event happened at the end of the Cold War, uh, right after the Cold War, and then actually right after the uh, first North Korean nuclear crisis. In 1995, um, as, as some of you may have uh, read about it, um, I still remember this um, as a current affair, that uh, there, was a, there was an incident in Okinawa that the three U.S. service members uh, raped the Okinawan um, underage schoolgirl, and that triggered the uh, big move in, movement of anti-U.S. base across Japan, which eventually led to U.S. and Japanese government uh, jointly established the uh, Special Action Committee on Okinawa, SACO, as, uh, as abbreviated call it. And this became the base, uh, basic framework for two countries to discuss the uh, reducing the uh, US, uh, U.S. military presence, particularly in Okinawa. And to this day, this issue has not been completely resolved. And the uh, main uh, big thorn in this, uh, in this uh, realignment issue uh, between U.S. and Japan is the relocation of a Marine Corps air station in Futama, Okinawa which was, when it was originally set up, it was in right in the middle of nowhere in the rural area. But since then, as the urbanization of Oki um, Okinawa itself progressed, um, MCAS, now, MCAS FEMA now sits in the middle of an ur urban area. So it has been almost, uh, almost uh, close to 30 years now that the two governments have been trying to relocate this uh, air station into a northern part of the prefecture that are less populated, therefore supposed to be less Less, uh, um, poses a less risk toward the uh, Okinawa residents. But uh, this relocation has not yet complete. Following that agreement to uh, work, work to reduce U.S. military presence in Okinawa, two governments actually set out to uh, revise the guidelines for the first time since 1978. This was in response to the gap that, uh, that was identified in the uh, modes of cooperation between U.S. military and Japan's self-defense force, not in the uh, not necessarily in the uh, uh, 
um, homeland defense uh, crisis for Japan, but rather how alliance can respond and how U.S. and Japan's um, armed forces respect, respectively have to uh, have to have to uh, maneuver in the time of a regional crisis. And under this guideline in, of 1997. Um, two countries agreed to um, create the uh, three categories of defense cooperation. One is in peacetime. One is in this, this is a rather mouthy situation in the area surrounding Japan, which is, uh, which is often called PSJ, and Japan's homeland defense. And in each, under each scenario, two governments have come up with a list of the, uh, list of the uh, tasks that the each U.S. force and forces and self, uh, Japan, Japan self-defense force undertake in each of those scenarios. And I will um, I will talk a little bit more about this for my for my uh, end of my remarks, in, especially on the challenges section. But the bit, even with this divi division of roles and categorization of uh, different scenarios that the alliance would face, there there were still some major gaps. And in and in the meantime, uh, about 20 years, um, about 10 years after um, two governments had agreed to uh, relocate the uh, FEMA air station in Okinawa, they actually revised that agreement a little bit under the framework of a defense policy renew review initiative. This was uh, in uh, this was this happened in close conjunction with the uh, United States own global posture review that took place um, in the aftermath of the 9/11. Uh, uh, terrorist incident in 2001, and the war on terror and the uh, U.S. military activities in Iraq that uh, followed. But uh, not much has changed, except that uh, a slight change in the location of the uh, relocation uh, destination for uh, MCAS FEMA and the uh, timeline that was um, that was uh, reset. And mo most recently, one of the major uh, developments. In between the U.S. and Japan was in 2015. This was under Prime Minister Abe's watch that the U.S. and Japan revised the uh, guidelines for the second time. So the whole purpose of the revision of this time around is to try to fill the gap that still remained um, under the 1997 um, guidelines cooperation. The gap practically um, and specifically there was a uh, there was a uh, issue with the uh, Japan's national security legislation that really pre prevented Japan from moving the uh, modes of uh, modes of operation of Japan's self-defense forces from one scenario to the other. So, for example, um, it was very com Japan Japanese side had to go through very cumbersome process from a peacetime operation mode to regional contingency operation or peacetime operation to contingency operation, which could escalate into a homeland defense uh, scenario. So the purpose of the second revision in 19, uh, 2015 was to close that gap to facilitate a smoother, uh, they called it seamless, the smoother uh, defense cooperation between US military force and Japan's self-defense force in the, um, in the full spectrum of the, uh, of the emergency. Next, please. And this here, you see the uh, main takeaway of the uh, most uh, recent development that happened in the U.S.-Japan alliance um, under the Biden administration. The year 2022 began with the uh, Security Consultative Committee, known as 2 plus 2, which is a meet, cabinet level meeting between foreign ministers and defense minister of U.S. and Japan on January 6th. 2022. So we're barely crawling out of the uh, New Year holiday for this uh, meeting to happen. And uh, following the meeting, there was a joint statement that was issued. And uh, you, this is uh, what you see in the key takeaways. Uh, one of the main one of the main take key takeaway is the uh, emphasis on the uh, con constantly modernizing the alliance. And uh, and strengthen joint capabilities, and by fully aligning uh, strategy and prioritizing goals together. So there's a really emphasis on US-Japan um, 
revising, constantly modernizing, um, revising its uh, policy priorities, strategic priorities in tandem, in, in lockstep. Another key takeaway on this is that the emphasis on Japan's de determination to fundamentally reinforce the, its own defense capabilities to bolster its national defense and contribute to regional, regional peace and stability. And you can see the uh, full joint statement in the uh, State Department website, and I'll put up the link, uh, link here for anyone who's interested in looking at it more in detail later. Next, please. So now that the U.S. and Japan focusing, putting a lot more emphasis on doing things together, obviously Japan is trying to uh, respond to this in its own way as well. And, uh, and the areas in which uh, Japan makes its own efforts is in threefold. And first is really driven by Japan's evolving threat perception. So obviously during the Cold War, uh, US, U.S. and the Soviet Union's strategic competition was really the overarching um, architecture under which the Japan formulated its defense policy. And another premise that Japan's defense policy during national security policy during the Cold War War was stipulated was a premise and premise under the U.S. supremacy um, as a leader of the Western Bloc. But since the end of the Cold War, um, this uh, this uh, threat perception and the uh, their response to it uh, begins to evolve. After the very brief period of uh, Japan uh, contemplating idea of the peace dividend, um, it was rudely awakened by the fact that North Korea's nuclear uh, capabilities are, um, in North Korea, its own neighbor, is developing its nuclear and the ballistic missile capabilities. So that was truly a rude awakening to Japan that uh, just because Cold War was over, um, its, neighbor, its neighborhood is not necessarily safe. And if anything, um, it, it might have become a little um, more unstable for Japan. So that became a prime concern for Japan for, in terms of national security during the 1990s. However, while that North Korea threat uh, remains constant to this day, in the beginning of the 21st century, Japan began to face more greater pressure from, uh, from China on the security front. As China's economic power rises, um, its confidence, confidence grows, and its investment in its military modernization grows. So in the area of, mainly in the area of East China Sea and Senkaku, Japan has been feeling growing pressure for Chinese uh, behavior to assert its um, territorial claim on on this area. And uh, this trend is still, if anything, um, it, it is uh, becoming more intensified, in, intense. So uh, fast forward today, um, like I alluded to, Japan today faces uh, two very different kinds of uh, national security threats. So on one hand, North Korea, it's more short-term, more immediate, and it's more kinetic. But it's very, very narrow in focus to uh, its, uh, its uh, missile and nuclear capabilities. But on the other hand, now uh, Japan also faces challenges from China, which is, which is more com complex and comprehensive because it does involve all elements of national power. And now the situation becomes more and more complicated for Japan because um, because of the uh, ever intensifying strategic competition between U.S. and China in the last few years. Next, please. So, as those uh, Japan's uh, threat perception evolves, uh, Japan tries to respond to it by first and foremost making its own effort to buttress its defense capabilities. So. First thing first is to modernize the set of defense bills that dictate what uh, what Japan can and cannot do. More specifically, what Japan's self-defense force is allowed to do in what situation or what it cannot do. And it culminated into the effort of Japanese government to do a partial reinterpretation of the Article 9 of the Constitution, 
which had prohibited Japan from exercising the right of collective self-defense altogether. So today, Japan, Japan is allowed to um, exercise right of collective self-defense in the a couple of a couple of a, four limited scenarios. And I'll be happy to talk about pros and cons about this uh, partial reinterpretation of the Article 9 in the Q&A. And as they go about the uh, reinterpretation of the Constitution, Japan also uh, began to revise some of some of its uh, declaratory, poli declaratory policy. These are the policies that were set as the policies based on the diet resolution, not necessarily non, not, not necessarily legal binding, but still over time has been set as a norm for Japanese national security policy. So some of those areas include the allowing um, national security use of the uh, outer space, uh, revision of the guidelines for defense equipment transfer. So those are the two main things. But then also, um, Japan has done something new back in 20, 2013 by uh, passing the uh, national, um, secret, uh, national Secret Law Protection Law, that which Japan never had in the past. But now, um, now Japan can um, now now Japan can um, uh, press charges against those who leak national security sensitive information, and uh, that was actually the uh, that was actually the, a big deal in Japan back then when it first uh, got adopted. And more so is the uh, in December 2013, Japan adopted its first ever national security strategy. And there, it really laid out um, Japan's security priority um, first and foremost as a national defense. Second important is to make sure that the Japan does contribute to uh, maintaining regional peace and stability. And third, and for, uh, third, and third but not, not least, um, Japan does more to uh, contribute to create an international environment that is more conducive for Japan to uh, protect its own national interests. As Japan um, set out its national, first national security strategy, it also revised the National Defense Program Guidelines, NDPG, and Midterm Defense Program, M MTDP, in 2013. These two documents are more specifically having to do with the uh, defense policy and the uh, Japan's defense acquisition plan over, uh, over the uh, five years. So one, after it was uh, once uh, revised in 2013, it was revised, they were both revised again in 2018. And both of these documents, um, North Korea and China, were identified as the main security concern. And uh, currently um, under the NDPG in 2000, uh, that was passed in 2018, Japan strives to have the multidimensional and joint defense force. This is a little bit of a mouthful, but that is really emphasizing more joint operation, cross-domain operation, sustainability of the operation, and resiliency of its, not just its operation, but its facility. And also, um, current uh, Japan's defense investment priorities are set in the uh, areas that you see, uh, cyber, electronic magnetic waves, and other emerging technologies, space, amphibious capabilities. This was specifically um, this, this was specifically identified as a necessary capability for Japan to have to counter um, Chinese in intensifying uh, pressure in the Senkaku Islands and uh, East China Sea. Ballistic missile defense specifically have North Korea in mind. Next, please. And as Japan set about to uh, make its own effort to buttress its own defense capability, it also, um, it also has been striving to make some changes in the context of the alliance as well. And it's really revolving around Japan's effort to seek to play a greater role within the alliance. And that's what was a revision of the guideline back in 2014, 2015 was all about, is that uh, in exchange of uh, seeking more of a clarification and a firmer commitment from the US on its uh, assistance of uh, Japan to defend Senkaku Islands in the case of uh, in case of in, in times of uh, crisis, 
uh, Japan uh, committed itself to play a greater role in a broader scope of activities that, that could utilize self-defense forces and that can engage in the uh, areas that are um, beyond its, uh, its uh, immediate neighborhood. Japan also worked with the United States to establish alliance coordination mechanism, which is really the interagency um, coordination process that works every day um, across the different agencies to make sure that the um, communication between the two governments and all elements of uh, national security agencies will, go, will, will remain smoothly. And currently, and more recently, Japan Self-Defense Force uh, more actively seeks the opportunity to train with not just with U.S. forces, but more increasingly so with uh, U.S. Um, other allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region. And Australia and India will become uh, first, um, first in my mind in, in Japan such efforts. And uh, because of this, uh, because of the Japan's a big year in national security policy and the processes that will go on in 2022. Depending on the results of those deliberations, um, it, is, it is very possible that, that this guideline might be uh, revised again following the uh, Japan goal after Japan, uh, Japan's a big year in national security policy is behind us at the end of the 2022. Next, please. So this is the uh, recent development, and this is the region, this is, this is the reason why I called at uh, year 2022 is Japan's big year for national security policy. The main reason is national security strategy, NDPG, and MTDP, all three key documents, are all currently under revision. And the revised document, revised all three documents to be released by the uh, end of 2022. We are anticipating that the uh, all those uh, three documents, revised version, will come out probably in the early December. So next several months, it will be a very interesting debate um, unfolding, both inside and outside the government, about how Japan should set its uh, own priorities of national security policy moving forward. At the moment, uh, we expect that the primary focus of this revised uh, re revision will be on the uh, Indo-Pacific region, um, Prime geographic focus is on the Indo-Pacific region under the free and open Indo-Pacific concept. We also anticipate uh, Japan to new documents to lay out the priorities on deepening security ties with Australia and India, so quad countries, as well as enhanced engagement with the Southeast Asia. But uh, with the uh, current situation ongoing in Ukraine, um, I, I won't be surprised if there were more words about Japan's uh, security cooperation with uh, NATO and other European countries moving forward. So that was my second point, seeking a greater cooperation with major NATO countries. And when I was uh, making this slide, um, I really had only a few countries in mind, such as England, France, and Germany. But as I said, with the, um, with the uh, deepening, uh, more aggravating Ukrainian situation, this could, uh, this could change a little bit in focus. And it could be more about um, engaging uh, NATO and EU um, more widely. And also, thirdly, economic security will be one of the key areas that will be highlighted in the, uh, particularly in national security strategy. And this is driven by Japan's increasing concern of the uh, supply chain resiliency. We are already seeing some of that uh, coming out at as the result of a U.S.-Japan summit and a Quad summit, but uh, this will be definitely the uh, one of the focus areas. And in fact, a Japan, Japanese diet had already um, um, introduced and actually could have, um, may well be passed it already, at least at the lower house, for the economic security set of uh, legislation that uh, defines what um, that defines uh, what economic security means for Japan and what Japan is going to do about it. And uh, this will definitely touch upon the areas such as export control, um, protection of a sensitive information, and so forth. But still, um, it remains to be seen how it gets translated into changing the actual specific uh, policy that Japan currently has.
Next, please. So to wrap up, um, I I touched up, I I did identified a couple of the challenges for Japan moving forward, specifically on the defense acquisition issue. Um, Japan does currently have a very extensive and growing acquisition list. Versus uh, even if Japan's defense budget has been increasing, it's still limited in terms of uh, what it can buy because roughly 50% or a little slightly over is uh, is uh, attributed, uh, basically earmarked already, um, to, for the lack of better words, for human resources related expenses. And what's more concerning for Japan's defense industry is the increasing um, increase of a uh, Foreign, foreign military sales in its acquisition budget and not enough um, budget for Japanese defense industry to uh, keep working on a modernization and other programs. So um, thinning out of uh, Japan's defense industrial base is a real concern, not just in, among defense industries, but then government shares that concern. And when I say government, I, I, I don't talk only about the Ministry of Defense, but uh, Ministry of Economic and Trade and Industry um, shares similar concern. When it comes to uh, Japan's defense poster, because Japan paid so, so far, the, uh, all the attention goes to what kind of defense acquisition program that Japan has, not enough, enough, not enough attention has been paid for supporting uh, structure for the self-defense forces. And this also, um, this also includes the uh, system of the retirement, um, system of retaining the uh, retaining non-commissioned officers, and so forth. When it comes to Japan's uh, regional security cooperation agenda, cooperation with the uh, Republic of Korea, South Korea, continues to be a challenge. And hopefully, as we know, um, South, South Korea will have the presidential election um, very soon, uh, very soon, and hopefully the uh, inauguration of the new administration in Seoul will provide the, a good opportunity for reset for the uh, currently very, very tense japan ROK relations. And lastly, this is actually my ongoing question that um, you often, uh, we often all read, read in med media and other scholarly journals about um, how Japan's, uh, Japan wants to play a greater role, Japan is willing to do this, and uh, um, all these issues that I just touched upon um, in an earlier slides are uh, identified as indication of Japan's will to great, uh, play a greater role. But do uh, Japanese political leaders really ready for those uh, greater responsibility, especially in the especially in in um, are they ready to articulate those uh, efforts that Japan needs to do to the general public to gain a support? So here, I think uh, how does that current Russian invasion um, into Ukraine, um, how that impacts the debate and how it uh, drives some of the Japanese politicians to be, begin to talk more openly about uh, Japan's openly advocating the necessity for Japan's uh, buttressing its own defense and also in potentially increasing its defense budget to make sure that Japan has enough resources to equip themselves will be um, will be interesting to watch. So with that, Ben, um, I hope I didn't go through it too fast. I'll be, I'll be very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, that was a very thorough uh, presentation. And um, of course, uh, these days, everybody's mind is on Russia and Ukraine and, and the NATO alliance. But this uh, presentation from uh, Yuki Tatsumi was a uh, good reminder that there are um, important developments happening in uh, another very important alliance, the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance, uh, that it's good to keep a, an eye on as well. Uh, if there are questions from those of you in the audience, please use the Q&A function in Zoom uh, to submit questions directly to uh, me and I'll moderate those questions. Uh, and while we wait for um, any questions to come in, I wanted to start off with the topic that's probably on everybody's uh, mind, as I mentioned, which is the the uh, events unfolding in in Ukraine and and what Japan what it means for Japan, uh, and not just the U.S. Japan uh, Security Alliance, but also Japan's relations with Russia. Um, and I noted that the 
so Japan has announced four um, areas of, of actions in response to invasion of Ukraine. So the first is assistance uh, with $100 million committed to uh, Ukraine and visa extensions for uh, uh, Ukrainians in Japan uh, who wish to receive one. A second area of response is in financial measures. So in addition to the imposition of sanctions and um, uh, the uh, restrictions on transactions with Russia's central bank, uh, Japan has joined with other uh, European uh, countries in the United States in excluding uh, selected Russian banks from the SWIFT uh, system. A third area of response is export control. So imposing restrictions on exports from Japan to Russia, especially in areas that could be relevant to military uh, operations. Uh, and the fourth is a suspension of uh, visa issuance to um, uh, uh, entry visas to Japan for those who are connected to um, uh, Russia. Uh, and then similar um, uh, measures have been taken also against Belarus and the, the two uh, breakaway uh, regions of Ukraine, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk uh, People's Republic. And so I just wanted to um, ask what your thoughts are um, on, on it, it's, it's obviously you know, early days, um, but what your thoughts are and what you might be looking out for in terms of uh, Japan's long-term response and what this conflict in Ukraine might mean for uh, Japan-Russia relations going forward um, with the Northern Territories and other unresolved uh, issues. I'll kind of give you, give you an open uh, space to, to uh, even raise other questions that you, that you think are important for us to think about. I appreciate that question. And uh, that is really the, uh, precisely the question that I actually have been already asked by my uh, Simpson colleagues a lot too. Um, one premise that I, one thing that I would highlight is that Japan found itself in a similar situation before, back in uh, 2014, when uh, Russia annexed Crimea. And it was when uh, Prime Minister Abe, who is known for his kind of a hardline, um, strong defense, you know, strong Japanese defense, strong pro-alliance image. And uh, today, uh, we have a Prime Minister uh, Chida, whose uh, image is you know, for the lack of better, was much softer, a more consensus builder, and that uh, there were a lot of unknown about his foreign policy outlook, although it was kind of assumed that uh, he would uh, carry the torch of the many initiatives that the Prime Minister Abe had set out. But I would note the, uh, the di um, response uh, that uh, Abe, how Abe government uh, responded to the Crimea annexation and how Kishida government now is reacting to this Ukraine and invasion of Ukraine are very different. Um, it's very different in tone. It's very different in the timing of they rolled out the sanction. And it's very different in the, um, the message that uh, those uh, respective leaders are sending. So let's just look back very briefly on what Japan ended up doing in uh, 2014. Yes, they did come up with a sanction. But it took them about a good 10 days, close to two weeks, before they decided on sanction. sanction. And when they did, um, they were very similar to, um, they, they were set up as financial sanctions about, and the restriction of the visas, but they were very focused on the bilateral Japan-Russia transaction, and not necessarily um, have the, uh, have the uh, broader scope in its own sanction. But this time, um, Kishida government came very quickly um, within 24 hours following the suit of a U.S. view. Um, so basically with the uh, U.S. and Europe, um, sanctions is not just bilateral focus, but then like you mentioned, Dan, um, Japan decided to go ahead and participate in the SWIFT um, exclusion of certain Russian banks from the SWIFT system, which is very big. Um, they also um, they also are freezing uh, Russia's uh, uh, foreign you know Russian asset, which is apparently about the six percent that Japan holds in the uh, Russian's uh, foreign uh, foreign uh, currency reserve is a uh, Japanese yen. Um, Japan is like freezing that altogether. But then also back then, um, Prime Minister Abe and both then then Prime Minister Abe and the then Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga continued to talk about the importance of open communication not losing, not shutting the door of communication with Russia. 
But this time, I think within the, within the last 24, 36 hours, uh, when Prime Minister Kishida um, announced the uh, announced the latest uh, rendition of the sanctions that included B Belarus and their two two uh, so so called uh, separatist uh, states in the uh, eastern Ukraine, one the first question he got was the question that you posed, Dan. That uh, how do you see you know Japan Russia relations for moving forward? And quite clearly, Prime Minister Kishida said, I realize, you know, obviously there is a bilateral issue, Northern Territory issues. We still need to work with Russia on a peace treaty. However, given the Russian behavior toward aggressive behavior to Ukraine, which basically challenges the foundation of the uh, international community that flourished in the post-World War II, for the, for, the, for the time being, it is impossible for Japan to look at Japan, Japan, Russia relation as um, as a business as usual, and it is not appropriate for me to say at what point we can go back to that, which was very different. Because if you recall, yes, Japan came out with its own sanction back in 2014, but just less than two years later, Prime Minister Abe um, in hosted uh, President Putin. In, a, in his hometown with hope to make a break, breakthrough in his negotiation with the Northern Territories. So that tells me a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, um, perception. Basically, uh, Japan's a perception of the in international environment that it, becomes, it, it has become less and less stable and less and less fluid is much more acute than the pressure it felt back in 2014. And also, secondly, um, Japan clearly chose to side with um, U.S. and European countries to stand with Ukraine um, out of the conviction that uh, Japan must stand on, on the principle that it preaches. Um, Japan always prides itself as a democratic nation. Um, I guess, you know, back in, uh, back in 2013, I believe uh, Prime Minister Abe talked about Japan as a defender of a global commons and uh, advocate of the international liberal order. And it, it is clear from what uh, Kishida government is doing that uh, this government clearly determined that uh, Japan does need to act like it speaks. So it has to do things to support Ukraine, support the principal democracy, and stand against the uh, unprovoked um, attempt to change the status quo. So those are the two things that really speaks to me. So when it comes to uh, Japan-Russia relations, as you mentioned, you know Japan and Russia have its own unique bilateral issues, and those issues are, you know, one of the few remaining legacy of uh, Japan's uh, World War II, you know, World War II surrender. So it is, it is, um, it's, it's, it's important to for you know Japan's foreign policy agenda hasn't um, hasn't uh, gotten smaller. It's just that the current situation is so much bigger and so much serious and the potential implication of this into Asia, Japan is very aware how China may be watching, how the international community responds and how Japan responds to the Ukrainian situation. So that uh, it needs to send a message by reacting and stand firm on the Ukraine situation. Um, it hopes to send a send message to China as well. So uh, unsurprisingly, um, the Ukraine situation is on a lot of people's minds. So I have two, um, two questions from the chat that I'd like to sort of frame in that context as well. Uh, so one asks, uh, one audience member asks, why, is Japan, uh, why does Japan have to rely on the US for its security? Uh, it has the ability to develop its own military technology and have other countries to have alliances with, such as India or Australia. Uh, it also has strong economic relations with the ASEAN countries. And I wonder if, like, thinking in the context of the current situation in Ukraine, of course, after the end of the Cold War, there were many people who were questioning whether NATO was obsolete, whether NATO was still um, uh, a useful uh, defense uh, alliance. Uh, and and uh, the... Um, the conflict in, in Ukraine has, if anything, um, brought NATO partners even closer together and, and with stronger resolve. And I'm wondering about uh, what the parallel um, uh, view is, perhaps, in Japan with the US-Japan Security Alliance. Of course, after 
uh, the end of the Cold War, there were also those who questioned whether the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance was ever was still needed. Um, but what is the what is the current attitude towards the um, relevance or uh, importance of the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance, and how do you think that the uh, crisis in Ukraine might affect that in terms of public opinion in Japan or or the U.S. Uh, and another question asks whether uh, the historical interactions between Russia and Japan uh, across various territorial uh, issues might inform their contemporary international relationship in the context of, of Ukraine. Yes, so the first question on that, um, then is that um, this current Ukraine crisis does um, impress people in Japan upon, about the importance of the alliance and alliance commitment. But then at the same time, it does, it did uh, trigger a uh, debate about what Japan needs to do more to uh, strengthen its own defense capability. But ironically, though, the seed of that really didn't start with Ukraine. Um, it really kind of happened, um, started to happening um, during the uh, Trump administration, when the uh, you, Japan all of a sudden saw an ally who, um, who don't, act like it appreciates the history of the alliance and everything became so transactional. And that's when um, there was the question has started at being asked within Japan that uh, is this anomaly or can this happen again? And let's not bet on the fact that it, you know, let's not bet on the uh, hope that it is just an anomaly. And after, if we endure this four years, everything will go back to normal. And it didn't get lost on its people, um, uh, and especially amongst the uh, government official who watches, um, who are involved in uh, security policy making. It did not get lost on them that uh, even Biden administration still, you know, talks about the foreign foreign policy that benefits the middle class. Um, the language of recipro reciprocity is still very much there, and uh, that did not get lost. So there are more serious questions being asked within the government about what more Japan needs to do. And I think one of the, uh, one of the demonstration of that is the, uh, this emerging, um, emerging debate about uh, uh, whether Japan should acquire its own attack capability, especially um, standoff uh, missile capability to defend itself. BMD is no longer enough. Maybe we should have an offensive capability. But then that is more of a that, that is more of a, I guess, a politic, um, that's more uh, done actively amongst the political leaders who really um, want, wants to take a um, tough tone on the uh, Japan's, uh, Japan's security policy and then how, it, um, how they feel like um, Japan is really overdue in increasing the uh, um, GDP ratio with, uh, of a defense budget, for, for example. So in that sense, when the uh, Germany recently came out that, okay, German, Germany made a decision, it will, it will go there. It will start increasing its defense budget. It will start, you know, it will start, it will reorient its uh, security policy. It definitely did um, um, catch an attention of many in the Japanese government. So I'm sure there will be more active debate, certainly within the uh, government as the, uh, as, those, uh, as I mentioned, those uh, three national security related documents are being revised and how the revision gets uh, eventually translated into specific policies and then also specific you know, allocation of the budget. When it comes to uh, Japan-Russia relations, um, I believe that um, you know, the baseline of this uh, North, Northern Territory issue is that Russia, you know, Russia broke a neutrality treaty and turned around and invaded and snatched those islands. So I think uh, this uh, current uh, Russian behavior is, um, is um, I guess, uh, reaffirming those narratives, so to speak. That uh, can, so basically, you know, making people ask a very, very serious question: that uh, can Russia be ever trusted to be a credible, you know, negotiation partner? That do they really hold, you know, um, hold up their end of the bargain, even if we do reach some kind of an agreement? Very interesting. Uh, it, it's it's fascinating how um, well many maybe not um, thinking about uh, Japan in this current moment. There are so many issues that are related and connected that could very well um, uh, come onto the uh, you know international in, into the international conversation with, with any wrong 
um, you know, misstep or mis, mis, uh, uh, misplaced uh, a statement by a political leader even. And I wanted to know, you mentioned differences between Abe and uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe and current Prime Minister Kishida in terms of their posturing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia. And I'm wondering if you, um, if you also have any thoughts on uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi uh, Yoshimasa and how, how he differs from uh, former Foreign Minister Motegi. And, and uh, I, I mentioned this, I asked this because um, when Hayashi was appointed, many people were pointing out that he's known as being pro-China. Uh, and I wonder what, um, if there's any um, you know, similar uh, discussion or, or impression of uh, his um, attitude or, or positions towards uh, Russia or, or, or how he views the current situation. If you have any thoughts on that. Oh, you're muted. Yes, yeah, so I am aware of that uh, question being asked about the um... Uh, for Minister Hayashi. Yes, so my, um, I'll give you uh, two quick points. So I guess it was not necessarily pro-China, but then he was one of those who advocated engagement with China, as opposed to those who are perhaps, uh, if you contrast that uh, with the, uh, I guess, the uh, image that the Defense Minister Kishi has, and, you know, he's more, op he's more open, openly um, open to discuss, you know, um, his support for Taiwan democracy and the Japan, uh, importance for Taiwan's trade uh, stability for Japanese own security. But I would also point it out, I, I would also point out that before he became a foreign minister, very briefly, that he was defense minister too. So he is well aware of the, and he was, and then he had that brief tenure precisely at the moment where, when a Chinese pressure on the Senkaku and East China Sea were really mount, really begin to intensify. So he is very aware of the, um, the security pressure, that, that security challenge that Japan faces from China. But it's just that, you know, uh, his, his, uh, his rhetoric may not be as harsh as you might see from uh, some of his colleagues. And, you know, I think Foreign Minister Motegi was a lot more, I guess, open about his uh, criticism and, and his questions about China. Um, Foreign Minister Hayashi may not be that. But then one thing, one thing that's going for him is that I think he seems to have a very good um, personal rapport with the uh, sex, uh, sex state, uh, Tony Blinken. And, you know, he spent some time in the United States. Um, he speaks very good English. Um, that, that helps communication with him, with uh, his uh, foreign counterparts. So, yes, I am aware of that uh, uh, kind of questioning about the, um, Mr. Hayashi's uh, positioning on China. But then I don't see that similar pro-engagement, overly pro-engagement, I should say, vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So I think uh, Mr. Hayashi has been um, very steady in terms of um, 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 steady, you know, offering a steady support, solid support for Ukraine, and then also maintaining um, good uh, communication with his counterparts. Thank you. And if I if I could just ask one more question, we've got a few more minutes, and um, I'd, I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, on another issue related to Ukraine that I think is on a lot of people's minds, and and there's no, there's been debate about it in um, in public discourse about what Ukraine might mean for um, people in East Asia who are worried about Taiwan. Um, that uh, if there's a potential parallel um, to be um, gleaned from uh, Russia and Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, People's Republic of China and, and Taiwan. Uh, some people are, are, are uncomfortable or nervous about um, uh, whether the outcome in, in Ukraine may um, uh, suggest some future uh, risk or possibility uh, in East Asia. Other people have dismissed that, um, that concern, um, noting that there are very different situations, very different um, countries involved in, in, in different parts of the of the world. Um, what is if if you've been following any of these um, conversations, or or uh, if you have your kind of ear to the ground on on what people in Tokyo uh, or Washington D.C. are thinking? I wonder if you're if you're willing to share some uh, thoughts on what are the concerns, or or is the Japanese government cl uh, closely following this, or um, what is the uh, what is the mood? Uh, in, in the air and the policy world about this possible uh, connection? 
So what I'm hearing is um, in by um, from my uh, Japanese, you know, colleagues in Japan and so forth is and friends and friends and colleagues in Japan is that uh, they yes they do watch this very closely, and in fact that really that that may well be one of the major driving force behind the um, Shida government's um, very different reaction to the current Ukraine situation because they do understand that they cannot, you know, talk about democratic Taiwan, support of, support of democratic Taiwan, and how international communities support Taiwan, when Japan also doesn't uh, come out very clearly to support democracy elsewhere, and in this case, Ukraine. So that was, that may very well be the, uh, um, one of the major driving force for Chida government coming out so firmly compared to the uh, um, similar situation that Japan found itself in a few years ago. Um, having said that, um, Ukraine and Taiwan, um, there's a very big geographic difference. Um, there's a you know, huge body of, you know, it is, it is very close, but it is still an island. And, uh, even, and uh, Taiwan is also, unlike, unlike Ukraine, um, you know, NATO cannot defend Ukraine because Ukraine is not a part of NATO. Um, Taiwan, um, U.S. has a, a defense obligation of Taiwan under the uh, um, Taiwan Relations Act. Um, Japan, there is, in fact, there is uh, some discussion going on amongst mostly conservative uh, Japanese politicians about Japan. Japan may need its own Taiwan Relations Act so that the Japan can have more clarity in terms of what it, what it can do in case of a uh, uh, Taiwan continue, you know, Taiwan, Taiwan Strait crisis, should that come to fruition. Um, and uh, I think one other thing that I would say is that uh, if uh, China is watching very closely, I think China also is watching closely how quickly international community came together. And even if um, they were, there are still worries about um, energy, global energy supplies and so forth, um, that really did not stop um, U.S., G7, EU, um, and other, even if, even, even for some of those countries who in Europe, like Sweden and Switzerland, who had held certain neutrality, you know, neutrality policy to come out of that on this one and come against Russia, joining, joining, joining the sanction regime. Um, if, if there's any message that China needs to take away from it, is this is very well the response that China could face if China tries to do something forcefully vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Well, we are at, out of time, but I'm just so grateful that we were able to get your expertise at this you know, um, crucial moment in, in, in history to help us uh, think through some of these issues and possible implications of the crisis in Ukraine for um, uh, East Asia, and in, in particular for Japan and the US um, Security Alliance. Uh, thank you very much to our audience for uh, tuning in uh, this evening. And thank you very much to Yuki Tatsumi for a really fantastic and informative presentation in, uh, in, in unusual conditions and with, with great de dedication and determination. Um, uh, it, was, it was really wonderful to hear your, um, your presentation this evening. I wish everyone a, a, a safe and, and healthy um, uh, uh, March and, and the rest of the year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye -bye. Good night, everybody.